Not long ago, my garage door opened up, and I could hear the uh, outside garage door open up, and then the inside garage door open up, and I knew it was my son Camden, because he's the only other person besides my wife that is, was li is living in my house right now, or was. Uh, and so he comes bounding through, and he's like, hey, Dad, uh, I got a job at Cheesecake Factory. I was like, hey, that's great. So glad you got uh, that job. I know you was going for kind of a serving job, and uh, so it's, I was like, fantastic. He goes, yeah, guess what? If I go when I'm not working, I get 25% off the food when I go. And I was like, wow, that, that seems fantastic. And he goes, yeah, if you go with me, you get 25% off the food too. And so isn't that fantastic? And I said, yeah. And he goes, and if you're going on a date with mom, if you take me with, then we get 25% off. And I was like, so that seems more expensive to take you with on a date. But okay, thanks. That's that's fantastic. So he starts off as busboy, and uh, he works his way up to food runner, and he comes home one day, and he says, hey, uh, Dad, I was, I was talking to one of the servers, and they said if you and Mom come while I'm working, that I could just say, you're my parents, and you would get 25 percent off. And I was like, all right. So I don't know if you have stu students at work. It's really fun to kind of go to their job and watch them work and be like, hey, look, they're doing things. This is great. <laughs> so we decided to go to Cheesecake Factory and, and, and check him out, you know. So Nicole and I find ourselves there. Uh, we order. He delivers. And, and, and I got this as he dropped mine down. He's like, oh, Dad, that one's fire. And I was like... Okay, I think that means good. That's good. All right, fantastic. And so he delivers the food. The check comes. And I look at the bill, and there's no 25% off. And so I'm kind of in this little dilemma. I'm like, do I, do I text him? Do I, do I go, hey, man, uh, I thought you said I'd get 25% off. And, and he's like, uh, you know what? I'm not going to make a sick Because maybe he misunderstood the rule. Maybe because he's not you know, sitting with us, we don't get that 25%. No big deal. You know, I don't want him to get in trouble. I don't want to make it awkward for the server. So I know that they know that he's my kid. So I always tip, you know, a little bit extra uh, for that. And so he comes home later that night. And uh, he was like, so, you know, how was it? And I was like, you know, it was, it was, it was fire. Like you said, it was really good. And he goes, uh, how about that 25% off, huh? And I'm like, so, actually, uh, we, we, we didn't get 25% off. And he's like, oh, Really? I'm like, yeah, he goes, oh, I, I may have gotten that one wrong. Uh, I, I thought they would take care of you. I, I'm so sorry, my bad, right? So sometimes people can tell you things with the best of intention. Uh, even people that love you dearly, but their info is just wrong. And so, so sometimes when you hear things that seem a little bit out of the ordinary, right, it's okay to be hesitant. It's okay to have some doubt. But what if they, had some, they demonstrated and gave you signs to prove and to show that their counsel or that what they said was true, was right? That might give you a little more uh, willingness to follow their counsel. Our account today is in 1 Samuel chapter 10. And Samuel is in the process of being anointed king. Now, if you recall, last week it started with some lost donkeys, and he found himself wandering around and trying to find his donkeys, and it led him to the prophet Samuel's house. So Saul and his servants show up there. This, uh, he, he has a meal with them, he finds out he's going to be king, but this chapter is him being anointed as king. And so there's going to be two different ceremonies that take place. There's going to be a private ceremony that takes place with him and Samuel. And then there's going to be a public ceremony that takes place with all of Israel. And so we're going to see this uh, account kind of unfold a little bit. All right, so here's verse 1. Samuel took the flask of oil, poured it on his head, and he kissed him. Now, in the same way, uh, back then, they would anoint maybe a new priest with oil. Uh, they started to institute, institute this for the king position. And so throughout Scripture, from this point forward, the office of king appears as one of the most sacred offices. In fact, it's going to be the office of king that the Messiah, Jesus, comes through. Uh, the king is God's anointed because he's the represented authority uh, and has power over God power over God's people. 
So he kissed him. This is a sign of and a token of allegiance. Now, you might be thinking, Samuel, I mean, this is kind of a day, right? A couple days. He goes looking for the donkeys, and next thing he knows, he's in front, or sorry, Saul. He goes looking for the donkeys, and next thing you know, he's in front of Samuel, and he's being anointed king. Now, put yourself in Saul's shoes. You might be a little confused like he's a little confused. He might be wondering, wait, what is going on here? I was just looking for donkeys, and now he's anointing my head with oil. He's kissing me to show allegiance, and I, I'm going to be king. Now, Samuel can probably sense this. He's probably looking into Saul's eyes going, yeah, you don't believe me, right? You, you're not sure this is supposed to happen. And so he tries to calm his fears by asking a rhetorical question. He's trying to convince him, no, you're not on candid camera. This is actually something that's going to happen. And so here's the question he asks him. Has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his people Israel? And you shall reign over the people of the Lord, and you shall save them from the hand of their surrounding enemies. Now, I want you to take note of the second portion of that statement right there. Save them from the surrounding enemies. Kind of just tuck that in the back of your head as we go forward here and as we continue to talk. Uh, and Samuel knows he needs a little bit more that, you know, for him to understand he's going to be king. So Samuel's about to give him three signs. Basically, you're going to go from here and there's going to be three things that happen to you. And so when those three things happen to you, you'll know that what I'm saying is true. That this appointment is from God. And so he says this, and this shall be the sign to you that the Lord has anointed you prince over his heritage. Now, if you were with us last week, you already learned that that word prince there uh, actually means leader. Uh, and Mark did a great job kind of explaining the Hebrew uh, backdrop for that. But the word heritage is, is an interesting one too, especially in Hebrew, it's pretty interesting. Heritage is a possession that can't be transferred to another. And so he uses this idea of you will be leader over my people. So by choosing these words to speak to Saul, Samuel emphasized as strong as he could that Saul would be leader over God's people. He is, uh, he, he is just over top of them in this moment. He, they're not his possession, so to speak. And then he says this, when you depart from me, you'll meet two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin, and they will say to you. So a couple questions come up when we read that. What's Rachel's tomb? Like, who is she? Well, Rachel was the second wife of Jacob. She was the mother of Joseph and Benjamin. In fact, she had died uh, giving birth to Benjamin. And so her tomb was a reminder of the origin of Saul's tribe, the tribe of Benjamin. And so Rachel's tomb kind of points us back to Genesis, where you find God's promise towards his people. These are what the two guys will say to you. The donkeys that you went to seek are found. And now your father has ceased to care about the donkeys, and he's anxious about you, saying, what shall I do about my son? Now, that might sound familiar if you were here last week, because Samuel already told him this exact thing. Samuel already told him that the donkeys were found, that now his dad's kind of wondering about him. So the message itself isn't important, but what's important is the sign of this. They were to be a sign. Now, you might be able to explain this one away a little bit. You're going to go back to your hometown, you're going to walk back there, and you're going to run into people who know your family and know the whole situation about the donkeys, and they're going to basically go, hey, are, are, uh, your dad's worried about you. Now, that wouldn't be that kind of mind-blowing. That would probably happen. That, uh, but then he goes on to another sign that has a lot more detail in it, a lot more distinction. He says this, you shall go on from there further and come to the Oak of Tabor. Three men are going up to God at Bethel, and they'll meet you there. They are carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. So Saul would meet three men. It's very specific of what they're, where he'd meet them, what they're carrying, what they have. And so he would meet three men on the way to Bethel. Bethel, uh, the name means house of God. This is a special place. This is where many years ago God had made promises to Jacob. And so the items that they're carrying actually signify to us that they are going to worship, that they are going to make sacrifices. And so they're going to come across Saul. 
He says this, and they will greet you and they will give you two loaves of bread. How many did they have? Three. Okay, so they're only going to give them two of the three that they have, uh, at which you shall accept from their hand. Now, these men give Saul two loaves. Interestingly, the presentation of bread has some significance in this story. Uh, in, in that day and age, it was a recognition, a gift of bread was a recognition that Saul had special purposes, uh, special status in God's purpose. If you recall last week in chapter 9 when, when the servant went, hey, I think the man of God is nearby here, Samuel. And Saul's response was, ooh, but we have nothing to give him. We have no bread in our sack. There's nothing left. Like we have nothing to present to this man who plays a special role in God's purpose. And so the sign wasn't just specific in terms of there's three guys, they got these three items, there's three loaves of bread, but you're only getting two. The gift of bread was also significant to Saul, realizing that, yes, God has a special purpose and a place for you now going forward. But that's not the only sign. He says this, after this, you shall come to Gibbeth Elohim. Uh, there is a garrison of the Philistines. And there, as soon as you come to the city, you shall meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with a harp, tambourine, a couple other instruments, before them prophesying. And so it's kind of interesting there. He, he walks them through where he's going to go, where he's going to stop, and he mentions this garrison of Philistines. Now, if you're an Old Testament reader, when you're reading this, you're looking at that and you're like, wow, they seem very far into uh, Israel's territory. That doesn't seem quite right. It doesn't seem like they should be allowed that far in. Uh, the, the Gibbeth Elohim it, the, literally means hill of God. The fact that they were on the hill of God is also kind of disappointing if you're reading this uh, as an Israelite. And so you recognize, man, the enemy is close by. The enemy has a garrison. Okay, think back. Verse 1, what's, what does the king do? Protects us from who? Our enemies. And so here we have the enemies are close by. The enemies are right there. He, he wants to make sure Saul is aware of this. And as leader, one of his responsibilities is to save them from their surrounding enemies. Then he goes on. The spirit of the Lord will rush upon you, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. It's a very interesting statement, very interesting turn of words there. Uh, Saul may have encountered this group before. He may have seen this group of prophets before, watched them prophesy. Uh, but what it says is the breath or the spirit of God will descend upon you and you will begin to prophesy. In other words, you will look, become like a different person because you didn't prophesy and now you are prophesying. We see this in other places in scripture. In the book of Judges, uh, the breath or the spirit of God rushes upon Samson and then he becomes kind of empowered and he, he defeats his enemy. There's, there's, a, uh, there's a history of this statement of them becoming filled with the power of the spirit. Now when these signs meet you, do what your hands find to do, for God is with you. It's a really interesting statement. Do what your hands find to do. It's kind of, you know, okay, you go, you meet the two guys who say, hey, your dad's worried about you. Then you go meet the three guys who give you two loaves of bread. Then you go meet the group and the spirit rushes on you and you prophesy. And then after that, do whatever you want to do. Like you want to hang out there. You want to go home. You want to go somewhere else. It's fine. Do whatever you want to do. That's not what he means. It's actually a directive. Uh, the task refers to military action against the enemy. So together with the promise that God is with you, Samuel's words here are directive. Once the Spirit of the Lord has rushed upon him, once you've seen the signs as confirmation that you are who I say you're going to be, then I need you to act against the enemy. The Philistine garrison presented an incredible opportunity for Saul to walk into the kingdom, right, with power and with, hey, listen, I'm going to defend us from our enemies. In fact, I just did. Samuel has set Saul up. He's put the ball right on the tee. And he's saying, listen, you're, you're going to have the ability because you're going to see these signs. These signs are going to build trust that you are who I say you're going to be. And don't worry, then God's going to be with you with the action step that I'm asking you to take. 
He's going to show you that he's going to be with you. And then after that, he says, go down before me to Gilgal. And behold, I'm coming down to offer burnt offerings, to sacrifice peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait and I, until I come to you and show you what to do. Gilgal is a pretty interesting place that they would mention that. It's been talked about in our Bible before in the book of Joshua. After the, uh, the, the group of Israelites had wandered for 40 years, they came to the Jordan River, they crossed over it, and they stopped. Joshua stopped them at Gilgal. And there they uh, hadn't been doing this in the wilderness, so they circumcised the males and they celebrated the Passover, uh, a reminder that God had set them apart, a reminder that God had freed them from Egypt. And so it signified this moving from this time of wandering to entering into the promised land. All of that happened at Gilgal. And so when he says, go to Gilgal and we're going to anoint you there, right? This is where this is going to take place. This is a new kind of step for the, for the nation. It's going to become a kingdom. They're moving from a collection of tribes into a kingdom. And he's going to establish them a king. God is very specific in this place, in this time. And we see God moving. What an appropriate place for this to happen. When he turned back to leave Samuel, God gave him another heart. All of these signs came to pass that day. So as Saul turned to leave, God, we would phrase it this way in our, in our English, God changed his mind, right? He went from being kind of nervous, like, what's going on? Like, what's happening here? Are you sure? To, okay, that sounds pretty legit. Uh, okay, I'll look for those signs. Now, two of the signs, we really don't get much detail on how that happens. We just get this statement, and all the signs came to pass on that day. So the one where they met the two guys worried about him, talking about his dad, the one where he got the two loaves of bread, we really don't get tons of definition on it. But the last sign causes a little bit of stir. So let's take a look at that. When they came to uh, Gibeah, Behold, a group of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God rushed upon him, and he prophesied among them. Now, this is not something uh, that he normally did or had done in the past. This was not something you would associate with Saul. You wouldn't know him as a prophet. In fact, you know this because the very next verse tells you all the people that are around him were like, what is going on? All those who knew him previously saw how he prophesied with the prophets. And the people said to one another, What has come over the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? They were a little confused. Those who knew him were surprised. Whoa, what's going on with our guy Saul? Is he also a prophet? I didn't know. Did you know that? No. And many, a man of the place answered, and who is their father? Therefore, it became a proverb. Is Saul also among the prophet? It became a proverb. It's biblical speak for it went viral. Like everyone started to talk about this. Everyone was like, did you hear Saul? Like he was prophesying. Is, is he also a prophet? Wow, that's incredible. This, uh, there's a little subtweet in here too. This who is, who is their father? Typically, prophets came from prophets. And so if your dad was a prophet, you kind of became a prophet. And so for them, they're like, Kish is not a prophet. So who's his dad? Like, what, what is happening here? They're so astounded by it. And it's so repeated that it becomes this, this proverb among the people. So what's supposed to happen next? What's he supposed to do? These signs took place, and now there's an action step. Now there's a directive. What, what, what should we be reading about next? The Philistine garrison. We should be reading about that. But we get nothing. There, there's no mention of it in the story. It, it doesn't move and say that he did anything. In fact, the fact that they're silent seems to indicate Saul's failure to turn his attention towards them. I mean, if they wrote a proverb about him prophesying, imagine what song they would have written if he had taken care of the Philistine garrison. Imagine the proverb that would have come out from that. Imagine how he would have stepped in to that moment. But there's nothing but silence. We expect to see it there in verses 10, 11, or 12, 
but we get nothing. Saul did nothing. When he had finished prophesying, he came to the high place. Instead, he just took off for Gilgal. You see, when Saul ignored the signs from God, now here's the thing, these signs had incredible detail to them. They weren't signs that you could really just explain away, like, oh, maybe they didn't happen. They had incredible detail to them. When he ignored the signs from God, he failed to do the work of God. At that moment of action, he lost all confidence. And it was at this point, it, it'd be easy to fault Saul. It'd be easy to look at him and be like, yeah, don't be like Saul. Amen. All right, let's go home. But honestly, if you think about it, I kind of understand him. Because I think uh, it's sometimes it's wise to examine how can we be like him? Or are we like him in our lives? Where you see God's hand, you know God's promises, and yet you come to that point of following God's commands and you're like, oh, like really? Now, uh, I'm going to need someone, oh, I'll see. Uh, Joel, hi, how you doing? Come on up here, man. He's like, what? I came to service? I wasn't going to get called on? I did this to college students in the other two services too. Hi, Joel. How you doing? Doing good. Good. Everyone, welcome Joel. All right. So I'm going to, we're going to move forward just a little bit. All right. Fantastic. So maybe you don't have lunch plans. Maybe you do. But if I said to you, and I saw you out in Halloween, I said, Joel, I want you to go to Cheesecake Factory right after this. I want you to go there and I want you to do what your stomach tells you to do, okay? I want you to order whatever food you want to order. I want you to uh, get whatever cheesecake at the end of that that you want to get and, and just order it. Now, here's the thing. You might be like, oh, Tom, I was a little bit late today and I don't have my wallet. In fact, I don't have my phone, so I can't use like Apple Pay. I have nothing, no way to call mom and dad when, when, when I can't pay the bill. So, and I said, no, no, no problem. You don't have to worry about it. It'll just be taken care of. <laughs> just go and just order as much as you want, and it's just going to be taken care of. Would you just go there? The question is, do I trust you? So, yes, I would do it. <laughs> <laughs> I love college kids. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, that's really funny because the other two people uh, said the same thing. They're like, yeah, I totally would do it. Okay, how many of you would go home and get your wallet first just to make sure? <laughs> all right, all right, some honesty. But what if I kind of gave you more reason to trust me? Like I said, there's going to be three signs on your way to Cheesecake Factory today. Okay. And, and that's how you'll know that this bill is covered. You won't see me there. I'm not going to take care of it, but I'm, I know that it's going to be covered. And I said, Joel, here's the deal. I want you to go out there and go to Kingsway. I want you to turn left. I want you to go to 60, and I want you to turn right. Now, being from here, you know that's not the fastest way to Cheesecake. Yeah. Nobody takes 60. A lot of lights, right? Get stuck in traffic. You are going to get stuck in traffic. In fact, I want you to get stuck in traffic because you're going to hit Parsons. You're going to get a red light. And you're like, I always get red lights every place I hit. You're going to get a red light, and what's going to pull up next to you is a white Ford F-150, and it's going to be trailing two jet skis, which is kind of uncommon this time of year because who in Florida goes jet skiing now, right? Yeah. All right, so they're going to pull up to you, and they're going to go, no way. I saw you online. I saw you on the feed. This is so cool. That's going to be the first sign to you. Then you're going to continue on, and you're going to get to the entrance of the mall. You're going to stop at the red arrow there before you turn in. And what's going to happen is a black BMW is going to pull up next to you, and they're going to look at you, and they're going to roll down their window, and they're going to go, were you at church? And you're going to go, yeah, I was at Bay Life. And they're going, no way. We go to Bell Shoals, and guess what? We got three boxes of hole-in-one donuts. Here's two for you. And they're going to pass it right through the window right to you. That will be the second sign. Then you're going to walk up to Cheesecake, and right around the planters right there, there's going to be a group of singers. They're going to be singing. It's going to be fantastic. And when you walk up, you're going to get this voice that you didn't even know you had. Like, I know Darnisha sounds beautiful when she sings, but this is going to be like 10 times better. You're going to be singing, and people are going to be like, how does this guy not have a record contract? Unbelievable. You don't have a good voice, do you? No. Okay. <laughs> I, I stood next to him sometimes in college group. All right. So... <clears throat> So that's going to happen. Now, when those signs happen and you walk then to the entrance of Cheesecake Factory, now, do you go in and order 
or do you go home and get your wallet? I get the steak. You get the steak. <laughs> All right. Very nice. That's great. So honestly, me, how many of you would still bring your wallet? Even with those signs. We're not so different from Saul. We're not so different. If all of those ha things happen, I, I, honestly, I, I would probably uh, get my wallet too. It's funny because the other college students, I was told this after the service, they're like, yes, as well, both times. But then one of them told me, he's like, yeah, if I run into trauma, I just call my dad. It's no big deal. <laughs> I, would, I would trust. I mean, I had an employee tell me I'm getting 25% off, and that didn't come true. <laughs> of course I wouldn't trust. Okay, so I do want you to go to Cheesecake. Okay. It's not going to be randomly paid for. In fact, I'm going to pay for it here. You don't have to go today, but hey. thanks, Joel, for being a part of this. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> but here's the truth. Before we get to... Uh, hard on Saul with this. We can go back and forth. We can look at scripture. We can see prophecy pointing to Jesus. Details about his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection. And we can say with confidence that he is who he said he is. And yet we can still face situations and decisions where his word is clear and we can come right up to it and we can go, oh. Is he really going to meet me here? Am I really going to follow him here? I'd, I'd rather just choose my own way. We're not too different than Saul. Now the story continues and Saul runs into his uncle. Saul's uncle says to him and to his servant, where did you go? And he said to them to seek the donkeys and when we when we saw that they were not to be found, we went to Samuel. So Samuel kind of brings up a thought in his uncle's mind. And Saul's uncle said, please, tell me, what did Samuel say to you? And Saul said to his uncle, he told us plainly that the donkeys had been found. But about the matter of the kingdom of which Samuel had spoken, he did not tell him anything. Saul didn't say anything of significance. He decided to keep it close to the vest. Why? Well, what didn't he do? He didn't go take care of the garrison of the Philistines. Perhaps he knew it would be too long of a conversation. How do I explain all this? The signs, one after another, after another, and then my inaction. So he tells his uncle a detail, but not the whole story. Those of you who have had high school students, it's like the high schooler who answers the question of what did you do yesterday? And you're like, I went to gyms, but they leave out the part where they're pulled over for speeding. Because you didn't specifically ask about it. Did you ask if I was pulled over for speeding? No. I just told you. You didn't ask if I had been anointed king. You just said, what did he say? So he just told him a little bit. Now Samuel called the people together uh, to the Lord at Mizpah, and he said to the people of Israel, now I'm not going to read the next few verses, but I want you to kind of notice, and you can kind of outline it in, in your Bible with, with me. He has a very distinct speech pattern that he's about to use. In fact, every time we see this in the Old Testament, this speech pattern, it's usually a sign of judgment coming. And in, in fact, bar none, it, it kind of goes like this. You get the statement of what the Lord has done. And so in this case, you have, he brought you out of Egypt. He delivered you from his enemies. He brought you into this land. The statement of what God has done. You didn't do this, God did this for you. And then there's a statement of what Israel has done, right? And so here we have, he, they rejected God as their king. They wanted a different king. They begged for a different king. And so you have that statement. And then you get the word therefore. And typically, after the word therefore, comes the judgment. It's interesting to me, this is how they announce Saul being king. This is a judgment on the people. The selection of Saul is announced like a judgment would be. You want a king? Great. Here you go. I'm going to give you this guy. This guy who runs. It's going to be awesome. 40 years of that. Enjoy. Now, it's interesting how they do this. They cast lots, which to us seems kind of like, what? 
they did what? It's very normal, very common back then, but they cast lots. It fell on the tribe of Benjamin, which is the smallest tribe of the nation of Israel. And then it falls on a specific clan in the tribe of Benjamin. And then it falls on Saul, son of Kish. Now, if you can imagine kind of this buildup, everyone's gathered, everyone's excited. We're going to get to find out who our king is. This is going to be awesome. And Samuel's up there and he's like, ladies and gentlemen, you asked for a king. No, you begged for a king. And now it's coming true. Meet your king, Saul, son of Kish. And there's nobody. There's no one. Samuel's like, "Um, anyone seen Saul? Where is he? Why isn't, like he knew this was coming. Scripture says they sought him, but he could not be found. Interesting. And so they began to inquire of the Lord, uh, is there a man yet still to come? Because the curtain pulled back and there was no one there. Like you said we're getting a king, but there's no one there. Like is he still coming? What's happening here? And the Lord said, behold, he's hidden himself among the baggage. I'm sorry, what? This is his moment. This is his coronation. This is his presentation to the nation. This is your king. And he is hiding in the baggage. You see, Saul ignores the signs of God. He fails to do the work of God. So, of course, he hid from the opportunities with God. He saw the signs, but he didn't follow through in obedience. And as a result, he's so overwhelmed by this moment. You see, the truth is, when we obey God in the small things, the big opportunities don't feel so overwhelming. If you could just kind of think, if you know, if you know your stories and you know the difference between Saul and David, David had these moments of confidence with God, right? Like, I got no problem with Goliath. I've done the lion. I've done the bear. God's protected me. God's been with me. This is no big deal. I'll jump on the stage. It's fine. He's ready because he understands who he is in God. He understands that God is with him. Saul doesn't have that history. He doesn't have that repetition of following God, of of walking and trusting God, even though God gave him sign after sign after sign and said, now just be obedient. Let's do this little thing, and then I'm going to put you in charge of the whole thing. And Saul's like, uh... Where's the baggage? I need to exit. Now, it's interesting, Israel's response. They're like, yay, we got a king. Oh, he's in the baggage. No problem. They ran and they took him from there. And he stood up among the people. And he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. They're like, we're going to have a king. We're going to have a king. Okay, he's not here. Oh, he's in the baggage. And they're like, hey, come on. You're the king. What are you doing here? This seems weird. But okay, come on. And they stood up and they're like, look, he's tall. He's handsome. He's perfect. This is going to be great. And God gives them what they wanted. A guy not ready for the moment. And Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among the people. You can say that again. There is none like him. And all the people shouted, Long live the king. Now some interesting truths as we look at this passage. One thing that stands out is our bad choices are not going to overturn God's eternal purposes. Isn't that comforting? Saul ignores the signs of God. He fails to do the work of God. He hides from the opportunities that God brings him. And yet, God still moves. God still moves. Now, you may be asking... Why are these verses so important? I mean, it's a really neat story with a lot of detail from the Old Testament, you know, like the three different signs and the three loaves and the two loaves and the prophesy. And it's really kind of neat. But why do we need to read this? Why do we need to study something like this? But as you read, did you see it? Did you see the glimmer of hope? Did you see the moment where where God was still moving? It's right there back in verse 16. The narrator told us that it had something to do with the kingdom. 
and yet no other explanation is giving, given. But now, here in verse 25, we're told this. Then Samuel told the people of the rights and the duties of kingship. And he wrote them in a book, and he laid it up before the Lord. And then Samuel sent all the people away, each one to his own home. We get to find out about the ways of the king, the ways of the kingdom. In fact, uh, that ver- the word duties can be translated justice, the justice of the kingdom. They're set aside. He says, the story of Saul has just begun here in our Bibles. But the crucial thing is really clear. Whether Israel had this king or another king, what mattered was the kingdom. And the kingdom of God was being set in motion in this moment. In fact, in the New Testament, John the Baptist will tell us in Mark, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. In the book of Acts, Paul will tell those gathered at the synagogue in Antioch in chapter 13. He'll recount this story. He'll say, they asked for a king and God gave them Saul, son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, which is a story we just read. For 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king. Of this man's offspring, God brought Israel a savior, Jesus, as promised. Right here in this passage that we're looking at this morning, God begins his kingdom work that points to Jesus, that points to a Messiah, that points to a king worth following. God still moves. Even in the disappointment of Saul, God still moves. This is the office from which Jesus will come. This is it being established in front of us right here this morning. This tiny slice of history, it's not just significant for Saul and for Israel. It's significant for us. Because as you sit here this morning, either Jesus is your king or he's not. Either you've bowed down before him, you've given yourself to him, or you haven't. And the question before us is, if not Jesus is king, who can save us? The answer the Bible says is no one else. There's no one else. God is moving here in this account. And he's still moving. The question is, are you walking with him? Have you given yourself to him? Is he your king? Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're just, you're looking for some more signs. You're just looking for God to point you in scripture that, like, is he, is this really true? Maybe it's that first step of obedience that you know what God's word says, but you're just kind of stuck. Like you know what you're supposed to do. You know how you're supposed to act. You know how you're supposed to treat the person in front of you, but you're just wondering, is it gonna work? Is it, is God right? Maybe you're sitting here and there's opportunities that God has laid at your feet and you're excited to run into them because you've had this incredible history with him of him showing up. I gotta tell you, when I examine this passage and I see Saul and myself, I'm so glad the truth is that God still moves and he still meets me in those moments. I'm gonna invite you to stand and and we're gonna sing one of the songs that we sang a little bit ago. So would you stand with us? And as we sing, I just want you to take stock. Lord, take the pieces of Saul out of my life. Allow me to run after you fully, recklessly, with abandon. Forgive.
forgive me for when I stop and act as Saul did.